This is episode 447 of the Foreign Policy Focus podcast. On today's show, I'm talking about impeachment and the Democrats' Cold War mentality. The Iraqi people are in the street telling the Americans to go home. And the president of Afghanistan says that he's just fine at 4,000 Americans. Important stuff to cover on today's show. Make sure you share it. You find it online over at the Libertarian Institute. I'm the news editor. I write the Daily News Roundup. The Roundup and the show are featured on the homepage. That's libertarianinstitute.org. If you're a new listener to the show, make sure you subscribe to it. Most of what I'm doing on the show is updating current events, so you'll get to see the most complete picture if you listen to the most shows, so subscribe and don't miss one. Last, you could donate to the show and really help it out over at patreon.com slash foreign policy focus. All right, so first up on impeachment, I will admit that I have not been watching the proceedings I think there's a lot more important stuff going on in the world than this, I think, fairly silly and futile political exercise going on right now. I mean, while I'm sure there's a lot of people that want to believe that some Republican senators are going to change their mind and uh, they're going to have the votes to impeach Trump, but it doesn't seem likely to happen whatsoever. Uh, they want to call some witnesses. It seems like the Republicans could do just as much damage to Biden as the Democrats could do to Trump by calling witnesses. So again... I think this is a relatively futile exercise in that it's not going to lead to the removal of Donald Trump. However, I have caught some of the uh, statements, especially by, I think, one of the people really leading the charge all the way through from Russiagate till now, because I do think this is just an extension of Russiagate, Adam Schiff, Democratic representative from California. I was just reading a, a pretty good article over at Jacobin, which, you know, isn't one of my libertarian uh, sources, it, you know, very left wing over there. Uh, but that article was explaining that, look, Schiff takes money from employees of weapons makers. He takes money from Pats. Pats help his campaign. And that money comes through weapons makers. And so, you know, the, this guy is like most members of the leadership of either party. Uh, they're, they're kind of a part of the foreign policy establishment. Whether you want to call that the war state, the blob, the deep state, the Borg, it, it doesn't matter. But this, you know, general foreign policy consensus that America needs to be constantly active and militarily dominant throughout the world to maintain order and safety, not just for us, but I guess for everyone. It doesn't really work out, but that's, you know, kind of their plan and idea. So it seems kind of odd that this would tie into impeachment, but. Uh, I'll get through and kind of tie it all together. Uh, the problem here is that the Democrats decided to impeach Trump over something really stupid. Now, there there are good things to impeach Trump over. Uh, you know, recently, the killing of Soleimani. Uh, but, you know, just throughout his time, the war in Yemen, that, that horrific tragedy going on right there now. You know, they have a dengue fever outbreak. 270 people have died. Over 70,000 suspected cases of this. And, you know, I, I'm sure that whatever fever or contagion is going around China is serious and problematic. However, you know, this is just one of the few diseases and humanitarian crises, not to mention, you know, actual people dying from weapons of war in Yemen. And it gets absolutely no coverage at all. So you could look at Yemen to impeach Trump, the killing of Soleimani, sanctions on North Korea, Venezuela, Iran, the war in Somalia, the drug war that he waged in Afghanistan. All of these, I think, are perfectly, impe uh, you know, perfect to target Trump for impeachment for. But, you know, not again for this silly Ukraine gate, Russia gate nonsense. So. Ukraine gate kind of boils down to the fact that the Democrats accused Trump of trying to leverage his power and potentially resources of the United States of America in order to open an investigation on his political rival, Joe Biden. Now, there's a, a few problems with this. One is just the amount of evidence the Democrats have. Strongest evidence I think they have is from Ambassador Sondland, who said, you know, it was implied that for the president of Ukraine, Zelensky, to meet with Donald Trump. He would have to open an investigation into Burisma, and this is the Ukrainian energy giant that's very corrupt, and I don't think that's super disputed. The The leader of the country has you know, long been identified as corrupt. But anyways, they hired Joe Biden's son, Hunter Biden, paid him tens of thousands of dollars, if not more a month, and the guy had absolutely no experience in Ukraine, spoke Ukrainian, or in energy. So, you know, it seems like there's probably some corruption going on there, and that, that's part of the Democrats' problem. So... That, you know, the Democrats are saying that Trump leveraged that mean as well as lethal military aid that he agreed to give Ukraine. He said that they say that he would screw that for a short period of time. Um, so Stalin said it was implied that, you know, for 
Zelensky to get the meeting, he would have to announce the investigation. Not even like successfully investigate and tie Hunter Biden up in corruption or anything like that, but just announce an investigation, which I guess, you know, would give Donald Trump some political leverage, but also that Donald Trump uh, leveraged lethal military aid to Ukraine. Although Solon says that he just assumed this was the case and has, you know, absolutely nothing behind it. And there's some, you know, other side fads here, like Donald Trump has long asserted that European countries need to do more for European defense and that maybe him withdrawing this aid was trying to prompt the European countries to, to pick up that tab, as well as just his general uh, occasional American first attitude, which, you know, he tweets out that we're going to leave Syria. It doesn't usually happen. The Ukrainians ended up getting their lethal military aid. But nonetheless, he he makes threats. Uh, there was some testimony in the House impeachment hearing that uh, has been completely overshadowed, but it is kind of critical. And that is, I believe somebody from the military kind of explaining that logistically, Trump announcing the aid was canceled really didn't do anything. So, you know, these are massive weapons contracts. And so, you know, the stuff is worked out months or years in advance. And then the orders are filled. So, you know, Trump would have had either cancel like a specific order like yeah, i guess he could cancel the shipment these javelin missiles that were selling to ukraine or i guess giving to ukraine through the military but that's not what happened um he you know he just temporarily cut off the aid then he turned it back on but I, I think the testimony really highlighted how at no point was there like a tactical or logistical difference between trump canceling the aid or not so that's you know in the case the democrats decide to try to remove trump from office i you know i think that's the important point here uh, Tulsi Gabbard, uh, and now, I think, put out some kind of resolution to censure Trump for this. And while, you know, that's, that's fine with me, I, I think, I guess it's appropriate. But it, it's certainly not something you could remove him from office on. And again, I, I, I do think there's reasons to remove Trump. From. Because the Democrats' case is so weak, I think they have to make something up to make it a big deal. And what they're making up now is that this is all a part of Russiagate and how Trump is trying to give advantages to Donald Putin over the American people for some crazy reason. I, I guess they can never really answer that, but, th but that is the thing. So we hear rhetoric like we have to fight them over there so we don't have to fight them over here. They're not talking about the terrorists. They're talking about the Russian. Like there isn't the entirety of Europe with a GDP many times that uh, of Russia and a military budget many times that of Russia. Two nuclear armed superpowers in France and the UK, an entire Atlantic Ocean be between us and Russia. And, you know, on the other side, certainly massive mil American military buildups in Guam, Japan, South Korea. Th there's no reason to think that we have to fight Russia on the Eastern Front or the Western, for that matter, in order to keep them from coming to the United States. This whole, you know, kind of made up notion of Russian aggression because Russia is concerned with the things going on around their borders in no way actually suggests that Russia is going to do anything to the United States. But, you know, people hear Russian aggression and then they hear Adam Schiff saying, uh, you know, we need, we need to protect America. So what Donald Trump is doing here is reckless. They, they kind of just put it all together and say, oh, I, you know, I guess Putin is trying to evade and it's a good thing that, we have the F-35s and all these ships, the, the four-class aircraft carriers, and we're spending trillions of dollars on them uh, be because we need this kind of stuff. So the Democrats are really trying to inflate the, the, the case against Donald Trump uh, with this McCarthy-ish rhetoric. And I guess to some people, it could not make a whole lot of sense as to why the Democrats would pursue that lie. But when you look at, and there's a good article over at Jacobin on this, who Adam Schiff's donors are. It's the war state. It's the people who get the multi-billion trillion dollar contracts for the new weapon. So, of course, Raytheon and Lockheed Martin are going to, you know, want to donate to Adam Schiff. And then when you go on Twitter, you look at either people from like FDD or these mainstream foreign policy experts, quote unquote, like Matt Spoot and Jen Rubin's all supportive of this because, again, they're all people who will benefit financially as money goes to the weapons makers. They donated to the Atlantic Council or whatever other organization that ends up paying these people or they'll run advertisements on the TV shows, the TV networks, so the networks could pay these people. So, you know, it's kind of all like a self-feeding machine. Well, I guess it's not self-feeding because we all have to feed it with our efforts and tad style. So anyways, that's uh, what I think is going on over in the Senate. And I haven't paid that much attention, uh, but that's why I surmise. And that's why I think the danger is to supporting impeachment. There's been two good articles over at antiwar.com by Daniel Lazare on this. 
Uh, I, I recommend go checking uh, that out. I can link to those in the show notes page for you, actually. Uh, that, that way they're easy to find over at the Libertarian Institute. So another interesting story that's getting a lot of attention in the news is that Saudi Arabia uh, and possibly even Mohammed bin Salman, the, the crown prince and kind of de facto leader of Saudi Arabia, was involved in the hacking of Jeff Bezos' phone. I mean, other than being the world's richest man, which, you know, is kind of interesting, um, he also owns the Washington Post. And so while all the stories are about Jeff Bezos, it, it could be, you know, Saudi Arabia had cell phone of Washington Post owner. That sounds like maybe a little bit more treacherous. So I, I like the way that's framed. But uh, the, there's a real problem here with... Uh, I have with Secretary, Treasury Secretary Steve Muchin, who said that the U.S. should continue to do business with Saudi Arabia. You know, U.S. CEOs, don't worry about this hacking thing. Continue to do business with the Saudis. Um, Man, almost unbelievable how much it seems like the Trump administration is just willing to look over the, the crimes of Saudi Arabia, whether they're in Yemen, the killing of Jamal Khashoggi, or even, you know, apparently the spying on Americans. It, it's a real wonder to me as to why. I mean, I know Donald Trump will occasionally tweet out that Saudi Arabia is paying the U.S. money for troops being deployed there and they're buying weapons, which creates jobs in the United States, but they're really not very good jobs. There's not a whole lot of them and, and those numbers are inflated. And certainly if Donald Trump was... A little bit more intelligent, he would realize that kind Saudi Arabia loses an ally would probably end up saving America money in the end, and that we don't have to have all these hostilities in the Middle East, or at least not so many. All right, so I want to talk about what's going on in Iraq today. Massive protests. I've seen some pictures. Uh, I believe uh, Motada al Sada, a very important cleric uh, in I Iraq, he represents, I believe, like a impoverished class of Iraqi Shia. He is uh, seems to be more nationalist than the uh, rest of the Iraqi Shia uh, parties uh, in Iraq who are maybe a little bit more concerned with Shiaism and strong ties between Iraq and Iran. And so he called for protesters to go out there and demand that Americans go home. And that's what they did in absolutely massive numbers. So I think Americans should see this and think a few things to themselves. One, the war in Iraq and the presidency of George Bush couldn't be a bigger failure. If 17 years after we invaded, the Iraqi people hate us so much that they're demanding we go home, uh, we did not do something right there. You know, this is plenty of time for information to come out, for people to feel the real effects of that war. And if they're saying that, hey, we want you guys the hell out rather than staying, even with the fact that there's a little bit of an ISIS presence still in that country, probably tells you how much they, they hate America. There's also the case that, you know, American uh, invaded that country and then hundreds of thousands, if not a million of them died in that war. And so, they, you know, they probably all felt the impacts of pressure then. And who knows how many more once you add up the fact that the U.S. insurgency uh, against the U.S. that was created in Iraq in response to the U.S. invasion, Al-Qaeda in Iraq, ends up flowing back into Syria where the U.S. supports it, and then it comes back into Iraq and kills a whole bunch more Iraqi. Uh, it, it's really no wonder that they probably want Americans the hell out of Iraq and the hell out of uh, the region. I think we should listen to them and just, you know, watch this and say, you know what? You don't want us there. We're not going to be there. Uh, no sense wasting more American lives and dollars uh, for a country that, rightfully doesn't want us the afghan president has said that he's fine if 4,000 american troops leave the country this is something that's been floated around as part of a potential like ceasefire or a deal being signed between the u.s and the taliban uh, the u.s needs to move forward with ending this war uh it, you know it's simply gone on too long people have made the observation that you know if the war was a, a child you know born in september october 2001 then by now it could vote over 18 years old it's a, it's an adult and yet you know the situation in the the country is getting even worse recently the special investigator general for afghan reconstruction you know the guy looking to oversee and make sure the the u.s war there isn't just wasting u.s taxpayer dollars says u.s officials have a disincentive to tell the truth about that war the structures are set up so they lie and continue to sell falsehoods and we're losing the war so you know, that seems like as good of reason as any. Since I'm talking about countries that the U.S. has absolutely destroyed, I want to talk about Libya, where it's kind of hard to remember uh, because it doesn't come up in the news very often. A lot of people don't talk about. But almost nine years ago now, the U.S. under Barack Obama and at the urging of Secretary of State Hillary Clinton decided to wage a war in Libya 
against the government of Muammar Gaddafi, allowing the Libyan Islamic fighting group to kill the leader and overthrow the country and essentially just throw it into chaos. I mean, you know, look, again, nine years down the road now, uh, there's two warring factions there. One is a warlord Haftar. The other one is allied with a bunch of Islamic militants. Uh, there's all kinds of international actors trying to get involved. Turkey with Turkish-made drones, the UAE with Chinese-made drones, Russia, France, Italy. Everybody find themselves on the opposite sides of this thing. It's an absolute geopolitical mess. The waves of refugees that flowed into Europe during the 2010s, so many of them, a serious an issue too, but flowed in because of this war in Libya. And it's possible that the Libyan state never returns again. I mean, at one time, this was a relatively prosperous country. Uh, not that I'm for centralized power or anything like that, but as far as, you know, African standards go, the people of Libya did all right. And, you know, Muammar Gaddafi was a, you know, torturing, murdering dictator, but that doesn't mean that overthrowing him uh, in alliance with a bunch of jihadists is going to create a better situation, just like overthrowing Bashar al-Assad in Syria would have done. You know, but Gaddafi was able to continuously expert oil uh, when I guess as long as the U.S. wasn't trying to ice them out of that and provide enough programs to the people that again by African standards relatively prosper he built uh, some uh, a massive thing called the man-made river which brought all the water from the aquifers in the south of the country up north and apparently all that is destroyed so there, there's so much infrastructure that it, you know it may be that that country for decades or a century doesn't return to the prosperity because uh, of this U.S. intervention. And who knows what the the borders will look like moving forward. Another unbelievable consequence of the Libyan war is just how it spread these Islamic groups throughout the Sahel region of Africa. This is Mali, Burkina Faso, Niger, Chad, Nigeria, where I'm I'm not even joking. I I read the news uh, all the time, and I would say per week, 50 to 100, if not 100 to 200 people are being killed in this region. Uh, most of the time, by you know different militant groups. Often, one's groups allied with jihadists or not, and it's not that every single person going out there and slaughtering people is doing it as somebody sworn to Bin Laden, Baghdadi, Jolani. But you know they they've allied with these different groups and it's inflamed all these. Uh, different ethnic tensions and uh, again i i think this week it was 34 people in burkina faso i uh, were in a building and burned alive over some ranching versus farming issues and, and certainly uh you know this is part of the overflow of, of the war and the blowback all right last thing i want to talk about for the week is uh myanmar where in late 2017 there was an ethnic late summer of 2017 there was an ethnic cleansing campaign against the minority muslim population the rohingya people over 700,000 of them were forced out of the country depending on uh, the estimates i've seen six or seven thousand people were just straight up murdered the army forced people at gunpoint uh, to destroy their own villages and then you know not sh- on camera not shown on camera was the soldiers with the guns but essentially they tried to make it look like the the people were uh, doing this to themselves and uh, what was pretty clearly an ethnic cleansing campaign uh, the leader of Myanmar and this is one of those countries where I think the central government probably has a little less control over the military than let's say the United States I believe her name is Aung San Suu Kai former winner of the Nobel Peace Prize, has really tried to downplay this and make it sound like what happened there wasn't as bad as what it was. The World Court recently ruled that the Myanmar government needs to take action to prevent what could be a genocide by the army against the Rohingya people. And the government has come out and said, yeah, we're looking into it. And some people were murdered. Some people were forced out of their villages. But there's no risk of a genocide. And that seems to me like something people would say if there's um, potentially going to be a genocide happening. Uh, so I, I do think that it's important to keep an eye on what's going on there, uh, especially because this isn't necessarily a, a conflict that America has a lot of interest or involvement in. And so it really gets no attention in the U.S., but uh, nonetheless, a, a lot of people are suffering. All right, everybody, thanks so much for tuning into the show. Hope you're enjoying it. A couple notes on the end here. Won't have a show out on Monday. Uh, I may put out a show on Tuesday and then again on Wednesday or just maybe a Wednesday show. I got some family things to do. Also, if you haven't already, think about heading over to patreon.com slash foreign policy focus and donating to the show. 
been doing this work for about four years now. First, I was writing some articles and blogging, turned into a couple different podcasts that I tried to put together before I landed on foreign policy focus and then started working over at the Libertarian Institute and antiwar.com. But throughout all those adventures, I had one great laptop that traveled with me everywhere and helped me get all this work done that you know, so many people really enjoy. But it bit the dust on me and I had to go out and buy a new one. So, you know, there are costs to doing this show and I appreciate when y'all could go over to patreon.com if you got a couple extra butts and help me out that way. I can continue to produce high quality shows on equipment that works. All right. Check me out on Twitter at K-Y-A-A-A-L-E, Facebook.com. Uh, there is a group, I believe it's just slash foreign policy focus. And that is where I sometimes, not as often as I should, interact with listeners of the show libertarianinstitute.org and antiwar.com. Thanks, everyone.